first thing I need you to do is I need you to prepare yourself weekly, all right? So I need you every single week to wake up and during the process of that week, I need you to have a sense of urgency. Something has to get done in that week, all right? So I just write this down. So there should never be a week in your life that you're just going through the motions. Like every single week, there should be something specific that you're trying to accomplish. All right, and then there should be something monthly that you're trying to accomplish. All right, every single minute of the day, we should be unleashing our gift on somebody. Somebody get it. I, I know we're gonna talk about this in a minute, but I know what my superpower is. CJ calls it superpower. I know what my superpower is. So when I get in the elevator with you, you may not speak, but I'm speaking why? Because that's my superpower. All right? Somebody like, E, why are you speaking to them and they're not speaking to you? I'm, I don't live my life based on what other people do. I live my life based on my superpower. So when I speak to people, people are my superpower. So if there's another human in the building, I'm, you getting it. All right? So... So I wake up every morning, I'm going to unleash my gift, but then I have to have a goal because if I'm not careful, I'm just unleashing my gift without a goal. It just is not going nowhere. And so I have to give my goal, my gift, I have to give it a sense of purpose, a sense of order, a sense of direction, All right? So every day when you get up, your week to have a direction that this is what you're seeking to get done in that week. This is how much money you should make. Oh, come on, somebody. Look, look, the reason why the $100,000 a week didn't come to you because you didn't assign it to come to you. You didn't assign it. So you just randomly hoping it's going to come. Now you have to assign it. You have to tell it which bank account it's going to. Oh, come on, somebody. You, you don't go to the bank and just give them $100,000. They want to know, is it your savings? Is this going into your check-ins? Is this the joint boy, right? So, so every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year, you should have a destination for your time, for your money, for your relationships. I had a really good friend of mine. I went to lunch and he said, I don't know who this guy is here in front of me. And he goes, let me ask you a question, honestly. Right now, what are you grateful for? And at the lunch, I said, jack shit. Nothing, brother. There's nothing good in my life right now. And I'm not exaggerating this to you when I tell you this, and this is a factual story. As I'm mouthing these words, two people walked in with an older man. Both of them clearly were fighting cancer somehow. Both had lost their hair. One of the ladies had a bonnet on, and they were barely moving in. Both walked by our table and gave me the most warm greeting, the warmest smile as a stranger. And he goes, that's pretty freaking pathetic. You can't find anything in your life to be grateful for right now. And on the drive home, I'm not kidding you, I started to stack gratitude. I started to take inventory. Because if you can find things to be grateful for in that space, man, is your life gonna be rich when there really are external things to be grateful for. So my first mechanism out of that space was honestly to stack the things I was grateful for. And I started reinforcing it over and over and over again. And what happens is there's this reticular activating system in our brains, right? And all of a sudden, because that's the messaging I was giving myself, all of a sudden, all these things start to come into my awareness that I'm grateful for. I start to magnetize to myself some people that I needed to find into my life, and that was the next layer. I started to see things to be grateful for, my health, my fitness, people who loved me. And what it did is it changed my state. When I stacked gratitude, I changed what I did in the morning, and I changed what I did in the evening. And so somehow by grabbing control of my morning and by grabbing control of my evening, I got some measure of control over the middle of my day. I was an out of control person back in those days, meaning this, I woke up worried, stressed, fearful, and I immediately start thinking about a bill I had to pay, something that was wrong, and I'm in a state of reaction to begin every, I'm talking within six minutes of waking up, six seconds. Most people listening to this, that's what they do. I said, I gotta grab control of my morning and I set up routines in my morning Maybe they served me, maybe they didn't, but they were things I could deliver on doing for myself. And so not only did that give me control over the day, but I started to stack my self-confidence too. And what were some of those things that you grabbed onto? Huge. So my morning routines are really detailed. Um, I get up and I hydrate. The second thing I do every morning is I do something cold. Something cold. 
So whether that's I jump in the ocean, because now I live in the ocean, but in those days it was taking a cold shower or splashing some cold water in my face or walking out when it was cold. It shocks our nervous system, our fight or flight kicks in, we're in a cellular, electric alive state. I obviously do some prayer and meditation every single morning. I've still not touched my telephone. So there's a rule, there's 30 minutes I cannot touch my telephone when I wake up. That's the hardest thing to do in the world and the thing that could benefit you the most because what's ever on that phone, you have to react to. And typically it's stuff that's not great. And so I don't touch that. I, I do my meditation and my prayer and um, I do some stretching. I do some breathing exercises. And then at that point, I allow myself to enter the world after I've got my state controlled. And I work out every morning, except for Sundays. I work out every morning. Talk to me about working out. That's something that completely changed my life. Obviously. And every time somebody asks me a question about, you know, how do I, I'm lost, I feel, you know, completely out of control, I don't have confidence, my answer is work out. Me too. So why? I think everything in our lives starts with our body. If you're a person of faith, you believe that's where your soul is housed, right? And so it's the, you, you do emotions. You don't just feel them, you do them. In other words, and you know this from things you've learned in your life, but like joy is an actual action not just an emotion. We feel a certain joy, there's a certain breathing, a certain movement in our body. Depression and sadness is something we do. We're more hunched over. Our breathing is more shallow, right? And so there's a correlation between the way you move your body and your emotions. They're directly, this is even before we get to dopamine hits and our nervous system being, I'm just telling you that the way you move your body is an emotion. You do emotions. And so when you move your body, you can't be in full workout mode, moving your body, running, walking, jumping jacks, jump rope, and be depressed. They don't go together simultaneously because your body doesn't get the connection. I'm moving like I'm joyful. I'm moving like I'm having sex. I'm moving like I'm happy. These are all joyful states. You can't be depressed simultaneously. So the quickest way to change our behavior, our emotions, and our state is with our body. Fix your bad mental habits. What they don't teach you in school is anything about habits. Yes, they make you memorize uh, geography and what the capital of Montana is and the capital of Romania, but that doesn't translate into anything of practical value besides being good at geometry, may, uh, geography maybe, which you could just Google nowadays. It's outdated way of learning. What would help you is the proper mental habits. And one of those ma mental habits, what do the masses do when they see something new? They're always skeptical. I saw that, I put out a video where I started sharing stuff in 2015. It's been viewed about three, 400 million times, this set of videos I released. Most people were skeptical. Oh, ties, oh, ties, what is this? This is a big scam. But a handful of people got it. One out of a hundred. And I don't like to say this because all the advertising compliance, but there's a stack of people who have become millionaires from those techniques. A stack of people have become uh, you know, gone from zero to six figures. You should train for that. Just like, you know, in school, remember they make you train, you gotta climb up the rope in PE, you gotta shoot a little basketball, they make you train with nine times nine is 81 and six times six is 36, all this training. What about the financial and mental training? What about the habit training to have the millionaire mindset? Nothing. So there's this thing people think that like, I'll be happy when? Once I get like this big, amazing home, or once I get this car, or once I get this relationship, or an amount of money, then I'll allow myself some happiness. The problem is the, the finish line always moves. You never arrive there, right? The other part is people think, well, if I enjoy myself now, I'm gonna lose my drive. In other words, if I can just wire myself with enough pain all the time, I won't lose my drive or ambition. The truth is there's no correlation between the two at all. There's no relationship between you feeling complete pain all the time and losing drive. And so I talk about living in a state of blissful dissatisfaction. And really the best example of that would be like if you've ever, uh, I love a good meal, right? You know, if I bite into a great piece of steak, if you're a steak eater like I am, you take that first bite, it's like complete bliss, right? There's no correlation between how great that tasted and your lack of desire for the next bite. In fact, that bliss causes you to want more of it. And so the more we can begin to reward ourselves with bliss, we're not gonna lose our dissatisfaction. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna lose that. And so for me, our brains, there's dopamine hit you get when you do something successful. If you constantly cheat yourself out of that hit, right, biomechanically in your body, less and less in the future will you want to achieve the next level, the next dream, the next step. And that's why so many people stall out in life. They, didn't, they got to a certain point and they cheated themselves out of the bliss, out of the celebration. It's important that we celebrate our wins, we celebrate our lives because it causes us to want the next bite. It keeps us hungrier, not the reverse. 
And so for me, I want to live in a state of being grateful and blissful now, not waiting for some future place or date that may never arise. Growing up, my dad used to encourage my brother and me to fail. So at the dinner table, he would actually ask us, what did you fail at this week? And if we didn't have something to tell him, he would actually be disappointed. And I can remember coming home from school and being like, Dad, Dad, I tried out for this and I was horrible. And he'd be like, way to go and high five me. <laughs> and what, it was such a gift what he was doing. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was redefining failure for me. And so failure became not about the outcome, but about not trying. And so, you know, the fear of failure, as we all know, as entrepreneurs, is one of the greatest fears in life. It's one of the things that stops us in our tracks and keeps us from trying something. Um, and so I, you know, I incorporate that in my philosophy at Spanx. We have, we celebrate failures. We talk about them. We have oops meetings where I'll announce the oops that I have. And sometimes we have fun with it. We'll even attach theme songs to our oops <laughs> and we'll play them in front of the whole company but I think it's just so important to, to try to get the people that you work with to take risks and to be entrepreneurial and not live in a place of I want to protect my job and feel like I'm not safe if I make mistakes. If you believe in what you're doing um, you know many people will tell you uh, you know what why you're mistaken why it'll never work um, you know but if you really believe passionately in what you're doing just just um, uh, you know, keep going. You know, keep keep pushing on. Keep pushing on, and, and, and until you either succeed or at least you you know you, you realize that uh, you, you, you know it's just it's, it's just not going to happen. And um, and and then if it if you don't succeed, pick yourself up and uh, and you know try again. And, and and ultimately, you know, if you you know if you're that determined, you will succeed in life. Um, and. Um, uh, and if you don't, you'll have a hell of a lot of fun trying. The people I know that are really happy are very self-aware. In fact, the best entrepreneurs I know are very self-aware. They're aware of their shortcomings, right? They want to improve them. They want to get to the next version of themselves all the time. And so for me, self-confidence comes because I didn't have it. And I think anytime you meet somebody like yourself or myself who might now appear self-confident, because I really had to find tools and resources because I was so insecure and shy and introverted. So I had to find techniques and resources to build that up in me. And for me, it's very simple. It's the promises that I keep to myself. If I have a habit over and over of getting to stack one on top of the other of keeping promises I make to me, not other people. In other words, the minute you begin to get external in your life, worrying about what other people think about you, right? You've, you've lost all control. You, and it, and it never fills you up. And people's admiration, people's gratitude towards you will never fill you up. It's your own, it's your own inside. And so for me, self-confidence comes from keeping the promises I make to myself. And the other part of it is being aware I'm doing it. In other words, most people don't give themselves enough credit all the time. They're very aware of these 20% things and not aware of the 80, right? And that's why the dosage is so important too. You've nailed it, it should be 80, 20 right because people get addicted to this I'm not good at this uh, people don't like this about me I don't feel good instead of focusing on the 80 and stacking it up wow I did eat what I said I was going to today I did get up when I said I was going to I made the amount of phone calls I treated people in such a way I promised myself it's not just doing those things it's rewarding it. it's being aware of it and stacking that up when I work with athletes the successful athletes I work with when they're in a slump it's never that they can't hit a ball anymore or make a shot or swing a golf club. They've lost their self-confidence. Somewhere along the way, they've lost the ability to focus on the things they are great at and stacking those promises they make to themselves. And the way I get them to break their slump is not correcting their swing or getting them positive. It's getting them to acknowledge the small promises, showing up to batting practice early, hitting that extra bucket of balls, beginning to reward themselves for the extra promises they keep to themselves, puts them back in a state of self-confidence. All of a sudden, they're hitting the ball great again.